Daniel Campbell, welcome to the Outperform Podcast. How are you? I'm doing all right. Thanks. I, uh, I'm glad to be on. We love having you on. How do you define outperforming in your life and what does it mean to you to outperform? I think outperforming is pushing back your limitations. Uh, so whether that is mentally or physically, um, if you can wield your faculties with greater effect today than you did yesterday, I, I say that that qualifies as outperforming. I would 100% agree. And I'm betting that most of the audience that's listening or watching this right now is probably not aware of your story. Would you mind sharing that? Because it is one of the more um, intriguing and powerful stories of all the guests that I've brought on to the Outperform podcast. Sure. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm 27 right now. And in 2012, I was uh, 20 years old. And I was going to college. I was an English major. And um, I was a, a member of a fraternity. And I was doing the very typical American college thing where I partied a lot and, um, you know, attended classes. And I got a passing GPA. But that was about it. Where were you um, going to college? Augustana. It's in Illinois. It's a small liberal arts school. Yeah. No, I, I've heard of it. Yep. You do know of it? Yeah, sure. So I was going to Augustana. And <clears throat> there was a, an event um, that... Uh, for which we invited our families, the fraternity, a bunch of people came from the, you know, the general student population and we roasted a pig and we had some kegs and it was an all day thing. And it's a really fun event. And uh, you know, when you start drinking at nine or 10 in the morning, you know, some, some raucous activity can occur. And so by the end of the day, I was roughhousing with a, a friend of mine uh, and we were wrestling and it's something we had done a dozen times before we had both been wrestlers um, for our school. And so it was something that, you know, we just tended to do for fun. And this particular night, um, I took a weird spill, something happened, and I broke my neck. And in that instant, uh, I sustained a spinal cord injury. And specifically, it's a contusion. It's almost like a stretching or a compression of the spinal cord in my, uh, in my neck at C6, which is like maybe a few inches below the earlobe. And I lost the ability to move or feel below about mid chest. Um, and it was, you know, it was instantaneous. I just felt this warm shot go through my body, couldn't move, couldn't even identify where my body was in space. It was a very bizarre feeling. And I had a little pain in my neck and that was it. And then, um, you know, after I went to the hospital and talked to a surgeon, talked to some doctors, got some scans, the gravity of the situation kind of set in. And uh, I, I began to understand that it's going to be sort of a long haul. And uh, the presentation that I appeared at the hospital with was quite severe. Um, you know, sometimes when people get a spinal cord injury, they might be able to feel patches of their skin or they might have diminished movement, but I could feel nothing and move nothing. And uh, so they said the prognosis is quite bad. Statistically, it was basically impossible that I would ever walk again in their words and some of the doctor's words. Um, and so for about three years, my life revolved around physical therapy and doing physical therapy for a neurological disability is a really intensive, long struggle. And, uh, the recovery process is slow, um, and, uh, long. And so for three years, that's pretty much all I did four to five days a week, several hours. I would do stuff at home. Um, because I was reading these studies that, you know, uh, people who do therapy more than the typical five hours a week have better outcomes. Um, China particularly has this fantastic model around neuro rehab where they do six hours a day, six days a week for six months right after injury. And uh, their outcomes are much better than, than the America, than uh, North America. So I was kind of trying to fit that, that Chinese model into my own rehab. And it paid off. I, I, my recovery um, was much better than what the doctors would have predicted or the physical therapists. And then um, after three years of rehab, I decided it's time to get back, uh, finish my education and uh, progress my professional career. Um, so I went back to school. I moved to Arizona from Illinois and um, I started studying engineering. My interests had totally shifted 180 People always laugh that I went from reading Shakespeare to doing, you know, math and physics. Um, <laughs> and uh, just finished my engineering degree this last summer. And along the way, I built a little device, uh, an apparatus, 
to help me in physical therapy. I was learning how to build and design things in my classes. And then I was still going to therapy and recognizing these needs. And, and some of them seemed pretty simple to solve. Like, oh, we just need a device that a therapist could use to help me do X, Y, and Z with my legs. So I built this thing, I call it the Spartan. And um, it was to help me do a kind of therapy and uh, called gait training. And it worked really well. Other patients wanted to try it. Other physical therapists wanted to try it. Um, and I let them and they, they responded really well to it. And it slowly dawned on me that um, I should get this thing out into the world. A lot more people could use it. A lot more people could benefit from it. Um, and, and it could help them with their recovery and with their daily exercise, um, especially when they're uh, recovering from a neurological uh, disability. Um, and so I talked to some professors, asked them, how do you go from ideas and sketches on paper and a very rough garage prototype to something that I could produce and, and give to people in mass. And they kind of set me off down the entrepreneurial road where I uh, developed a model and I pitched it to judges, uh, to, to investors, and got some funding, developed the idea, uh, fielded it. And for the last three years, that's what I've been doing. I've been going to clinics, bringing the Spartan, ha having people with spinal cord injuries and brain injuries and MS and stroke, they train with it and I improve it. and then you know, iterate again and again and again. And very recently I decided this is good enough, um, which people had talked me into it. I think I probably never would have thought it was good enough um, because I'm something of a perfectionist. Uh, but I decided, you know, this needs to get out there. It, it, this can help people and it's time sensitive. So um, I had it manufactured and now I have a business around that. It's called Renegate, um, R-E-N-E-G-A-I-T. And um, I am trying to get this thing out into the world and improve people's chances at recovering and living a healthy life after neurological disability. Well, wow. Uh, the, sorry so, for the five minute. What's that? <laughs> sorry for the long winded answer. No, I would really appreciate it. And thanks for sharing the story. And I mean, I, I commend you for taking something so catastrophic in your life and using it to actually propel you forward and then to kind of pay it forward or to give back with what you're doing now. So we'll go back to Renegade and, and exactly what that looks like in a second. But I actually want to go back to just kind of initially right after you had the injury. So just out of curiosity, you mentioned that the Chinese had a lot better outcomes doing, what did you say, six hours a day, six days a week for six months? Is that what you said? Yes. So why are the U.S. protocols different if there's statistically better outcomes in China from what they're doing versus what we're doing? You know, it's all about, um, it's evidence-based practice. So in the U.S., to justify to an insurance company to spend that extra money, there has to be some body of evidence to support that. And when you're looking at outcomes on a population level and trying to correlate them with um, you know, uh, the, the time element in therapy, and then you're also trying to control for the kind of therapy they're doing, the intensity of the therapy and everything else surrounding what might affect an outcome, mm -hmm. that science is hard to do well. It's hard to do with uh, robust uh, confidence in the results. So I think bridging that confidence gap just hasn't quite been done that yet in the United States. We have this growing body of research into what they call activity-based therapy. And activity-based therapy, this model purports that, you know, intensity is very important and so is increasing the time, the, the duration of, of training and, and, and the frequency. And uh, it's still a little too new, I think, this is my theory, um, to use to justify to insurance companies to spend all that extra money um, on, on insurance. Uh, and it's unfortunate, it's very unfortunate because I've read the science and I've talked to a lot of people who have, and I've talked to a lot of the researchers who conducted the studies and it's really hard to argue against. And I think the study, the science is solid um, and that if people, if more people knew about it and just went straight to the source, the literature themselves, they could be totally convinced that, you know, going at it with everything you've got for longer than what you would typically get, it's going to pay off. Um, I just don't think the insurance companies have been convinced yet or some, somewhere in the system. In any kind of a big system, you're going to have some bureaucratic, um, you know, 
fluff that you have to get through some red tape. And I just don't think it's, it's happened yet. Yeah. So one of the questions I want to ask you, because in, in a strange way, I can relate very much to where you were at Augustana, where I went to the University of Wisconsin and was very familiar with starting to drink at nine at 10 a.m. And, you know, you're living the party life and you're a college kid. And I wasn't taking anything that seriously at the time. And then I just kind of gradually got to a point where I just decided, okay, it's time to grow up and be serious and do a little bit more with your life and make something happen. And obviously you had something that, that prompted you to make a shift. And I can barely even relate to what that might look like. But talk me through after that happened. I mean, did you go through a point where you were almost just like, screw it? Why am I even going to bother putting in the extra effort in physical therapy, because I'm curious how you actually went from kind of, um, you know, what, what seemed like a little bit more, uh, I don't know, lackadaisical is the word to a point where you're like, no, I'm actually going to go with this Chinese method of, of doing a little bit more, more duration, more intensity, because I know it's going to provide better outcomes. Like, how did you get to a point where you just decided that I am going to do this and, um, I am not going to be, you also mentioned, I am not going to allow them when they said, statistically speaking, I'm probably never going to walk again. Um, to want to go out there and to actually want to beat those odds, I just think is incredible. So talk me through kind of that mindset shift and what that looked like. You know, Scott, I have, uh, I've thought long and hard about that. I've tried to uh, retrospectively um, just meditate on the mental gymnastics that I did that got me to that point the circumstances in my life, um, how my family factored into it, friends, what I was learning. And uh, I think that if I could answer that question with 100% accuracy and efficiency, um, I would probably be some kind of a guru and I'd be making millions with a book that I would publish. But I have tried and I do have an answer. Um, I just can't attest that it's 100%. But here's what I think. I think that I did go through a phase where I was almost nihilistic, like it doesn't matter. Um, statistically, they said my chances are null. And uh, fundamentally, neuro rehab is a gamble. Even, I mean, I, I've gone to therapy with people who don't try very hard at all, and they're walking after six months. And right beside them is someone who is busting their ass every single day, five days a week, and doing some more at home, and they never wiggle a toe. Um, and so it's like the, the nature of the injury, the severity of the injury on a cellular molecular level, dictates so much what your chances are. Um, so even if you do try really hard, it's not a guarantee. And that is, I mean, that's life. You can go to an Ivy League school and get hit by a car the day you graduate. There is never a guarantee um, that hard work is going to pay off. It's always a gamble. And so that realization was critical. It was that even though, you know, right now I feel like my, my opportunities and my chances are so diminished, so minuscule, it's, it's very demoralizing. But I, I, I thought a lot about it, and, and I, I came to the realization that there was always this uncertainty in my life at every level, fundamentally, and it never stopped me before, so why should it now? So that was a big one. Um, on top of that, I can never neglect, this is almost kind of a tangent, you can never underestimate or neglect uh, the effect of, of answering to your biology. I started dieting. You know, I started eating seriously. I, I told myself, I'm going to go outside and get sunlight today even if it's only for 10 minutes, um, I'm going to socialize. I'm going to force myself to do these things that research says very clearly uh, helps with mood, with mental health. Um, and so I took those things seriously and it helped enormously. I have a very supportive family. I've got great friends. Um, I met fantastic physical therapists who could kind of educate me on the science behind rehab. They taught me the Chinese method. They taught me about activity-based therapy. They introduced me to the science, got me excited about it. Um, so that was critical. Um, reading, I think, plays, played a huge role for me. Just sitting in a room quietly, philosophizing, learning from the great minds in history about how to conceptualize your place in the universe and um, what it means to struggle and what it means to, to fight. And, you know, all that, I think, helped me enormously um, mentally position myself to want to do the, uh, to want to engage, to want to fight, to want to try. Um, so it was a lot of things that probably came to a head around 12 months after my injury. For, for a long year, I was very depressed. I didn't try that hard. I didn't work that hard. It was spurts, you know, 
I would try for a week and then I'd be depressed for a week and not do anything. And of course that kind of a, a discipline is not going to really get you anywhere. And then after a year I decided, to, you know, it's time to buckle down. And I mean, obviously throughout the course of all of this, you're looking, you're looking for small wins the entire time that you're doing your physical therapy, I'm sure. But was there one benchmark or something that happened where it actually allowed you to kind of see the finish line or the light at the end of the tunnel? And you're like, wow, if I actually continue doing what I'm doing, all those things that you mentioned before, um, I've got a really good shot at, you know, walking again at actually getting to this certain point because I can see that what I'm doing right now is indeed working. I mean, was there a little bit of a light bulb kind of moment or something that allowed you to see that? Yes, there were two big ones. Um, there's a lot of little ones along the way. And when it's neurological in nature, it's almost hard to tell whether you're imagining it or if it's real. Um, like I, you know, some days I would think, am I pulling myself forward in the chair? Are my abs doing that? Cause I don't have abdominal function or am I manipulating the air in my lungs and my diaphragm in such a way that I trick myself into thinking it's abs. And in that case I actually was tricking myself. I found out, I, you know, it's like, you want it so bad subconsciously. I was manipulating the air in my lungs and telling myself it was my abs. So it, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. And then along the way, there's little things, maybe, uh, one day my finger would twitch in a way that it hadn't before. But there were two really big ones that showed me I'm moving in the right direction. Um, I don't, you, you mentioned uh, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel or the finish line. I try not to think like that. I try not to strive for a very concrete outcome because always in life, if you fixate on one outcome and you, you, you bust your butt and you get it, you're still left with something of an empty feeling of, okay, what's next, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's more just move in the right direction, move in the right direction and embrace the grind of that process. So I had to sort of get my head around that and I did that. And then along the way, you can kind of look up from that and realize, oh, it is working. And those are the milestones you're referring to. So the first one was about 11 months after my injury, um, I wiggled a toe for the first time. Now, you think when you break your neck, if you're going to recover, it's going to be top down, right? So I'll be moving my fingers first and then my, my chest and then my abs. That is not the case. Uh, it's not top down. It's totally erratic. I wiggled my toe long before I was doing anything else with any other part of my body. So 11 months, I wiggled a toe. It was real. It wasn't a spasm. I wasn't tricking myself. I called my family in. There were tears all around. It was amazing. Um, it was a really cool time. I mean, it was earth shattering to me. Um, and then I think it was about 18 months after injury, I was going to get up in a walker and I was going to do gait training. Um, and gait training for me at that time was someone would get behind me in a stool. They'd help me keep my hips forward and they would use their arms to move my legs through the walking motion. Mm -hmm. um, but I could not contribute very much at all to the motion uh, myself volitionally. And this particular day, I got up in the walker and then as the therapist was going to get behind me to support me, I, I just tried to take a few steps and I did. Um, I actually was moving my legs and I was supporting my own weight. I surprised myself. I surprised the hell out of the therapist. And uh, it was another milestone moment, huge day, tears all around. I mean, it was, it was incredible. Wow. Wow. So let's go back to Renegade. What is the future? What, what is your vision for how you see that unfolding? And what would you like to do with it as, as a business? So right now within um, the niche community that is people with neurological disabilities doing rehab, um, I don't think this space attracts very many of the world's great problem solvers. Um, the engineers at, at MIT are working on the next iPhone and the next superconductor. Um, they're not innovating in this space because the market is too small. That's just the reality of it. When, the, what, when a market is particular. If you don't mind me interrupting you, and you, don't, you might not know this exact number, but I'm just curious, the scope of neurological disabilities, do you know like how many there actually are in the US? Yeah, I did. I did my homework on that and I think 2016. And I want to say, I'd have to pull this file up to get a good number. 
people living with, let's say, spinal cord injury in the U.S., I think it's around a million. And okay. then every year, there's another maybe 25,000 or something like that. Okay. Um, when you think globally, it's, it's like maybe 80 million people in the world um, have some form of neurological disability that prevents them from walking. Okay. Don't quote me on those numbers that I have to look at the studies again, but I did do my homework on that. Um, but really, that's not, the, that's not the real market. The market is people doing rehab. So normally, when someone gets a neurological disability, they might do rehab for three, six months, sometimes a year, and then they're done. So it's not people with disability. It's people with uh, who have sustained a disability within the last, let's say, six months. And that number is much smaller. Okay. Okay. So I don't know the actual number, but it is, it's a very small niche market. Sure. So okay. to give you an idea, to, to frame it, uh, when I moved to Phoenix, I was trying to find neuro rehab clinics, uh, uh, PT clinics. And Phoenix is a really, you know, it's a big metropolitan area. And I only had a handful to choose from. And some of them were really small hole in the wall. I was like the only person there. Yeah. Um, so it is, it's a small, small community. So for the audience, if you would like for them to be able to connect with you or perhaps support you in any way, where can they find you? How can they do that? Renegate.com. So R-E-N-E-G-A-I-T.com. Okay. Anywhere else or just renegate.com? We have, uh, I've, we've got some social media um, and I'm going to eventually develop a, a blog but all of it can be found on, on renegade.com. Okay. All right. And I'll, I'll post a link for that website in the show notes for this episode. So to kind of bring this full circle, I mean, God, you know, God willing, a lot of people that are listening and watching this are, are never going to have to go through anything close to what you've gone through. How can you take what you've been through and what advice would you give to people that are just struggling with their own things, maybe big and small, and some of what you've learned throughout this tremendous journey of struggle, but now being at a point where you're really doing something impactful and giving back, what words of wisdom would you like to give to the audience as far as just how they can use what you've learned to be able to make them better? So I think if we can, uh, if we can condense it, really far uh what i would say is first of all you have to take care of your your foundation you have to uh take care of your mind take care of your body if you are not functioning well none of your goals are going to be achievable number two don't move in the direction of a, a finish line or, or uh, an end goal a crescendo just pick a direction pick a grind a a, a an activity that you can enjoy doing that you can involve yourself in um, and start doing it. And that's really it. It's, it's take the first small step. It's got to be small. If it's big, you'll put it off till tomorrow forever. So it's got to be small. Uh, and then just start, just do it. Um, and it will surprise you how quickly and easily you can kind of get into a flow state and really start to enjoy it. And once you start seeing the fruits of your labor, that's the reward. That's, and then the loop is complete. And uh, as long as you can sustain it, you'll be, you'll be cruising. It sounds like what you're saying, especially when you bring up you know, not focusing on the outcome or the finish line, I will oftentimes say focus on progress, not perfection. Yes. You know, or focus on, and I think I recorded a podcast actually on this as well, that was just talking about falling in love with the process of just doing something and again kind of removing that outcome removing that finish line so when you were actually going through your own therapy did you find a way to actually look forward to the six hours that you would be doing I, I don't know if that's even possible because i'm sure it's just grueling but did you find a way at that time to kind of fall in love with that or actually somewhat look forward to what you were doing on a day-to-day -day basis you know, it, it was very grueling and I could look forward to it. Some days I would be excited about uh, the exercise and seeing what I might be able to do today that I couldn't do last week. Um, and then I'd go through periods where I wasn't making much progress and that sort of motivation wasn't as apparent. And then at that point, the reason I would look forward to therapy was maybe the therapist that I'd be working with was someone who was very interesting to talk to. You kind of have to engineer your own motivations. It, you know, if it's hard to find, if it's not really easy and obvious, make something up. 
So, you know, I knew that if I don't trick myself into wanting to go to therapy, I'll find reasons not to go. It's very easy to find reasons not to go. I can say I have a tummy ache even when I don't. Yeah. Um, and so you, you really do. You have to trick yourself to want to do something. And I mean trick yourself. So um, give me an, can you give me an example? Yeah. So I would look forward to that. That, that kind of was the example. Is if I was going through a period where I wasn't making much progress, um, instead of fixating my mind on that, I would be thinking about, okay, Sakina, the physical therapist, uh, she has an NCS this neuroclinical specialist, which means she's done a lot of research and she knows her stuff on activity-based therapy. So instead of fixating on that and thinking about progress, I would think about research and I would think about what we could talk about that day while I was doing therapy. So it's totally aside from therapy. It has nothing to do with my progress. It's yeah. the conversation I'll be having while I'm busting my ass on the floor doing therapy. And that's kind of, you know, and if it wasn't that, I would have found something else to look forward to. Maybe it was Today, I'm going to bump into Mike in the waiting room, and I haven't seen him in two weeks, and so I would get excited about that. You just have to find something that you can get excited about and then fixate on that. Whatever it takes for you to show up, to get there, and to start. Fixate yeah. on that. Awesome advice. Anything else you want to share with the audience? Ooh, that, uh, we, we covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time. <laughs> we did, but I feel like you're giving, I mean... I feel like we're almost kindred spirits because a lot of what you're saying is, is so much of what I believe uh, that I just know that it's extremely valuable. So is there anything else that you would like to share that you haven't already up to this point? You know, nothing comes to mind. Um, yeah, maybe read more. I don't want to, I don't want to understate that. Like, when I read, it's so meditative and calming and you will bump into great ideas that stimulate your mind. Maybe that was the way I was able to trick myself to get excited about in so many different ways. I think I notice in my life anyways that I go through long periods where I don't read a book at all. Um, I just finished graduating uh, you know, engineering school and for four years I maybe read four books. Yeah. And you know, my ability to function and be mentally well is somewhat diminished. But then as soon as I graduated and I started reading again, it was like this revitalization process. And before that I was reading, I was a voracious reader and it made such a difference to me. And I'm sure it, with different people it can be something slightly different, but just engaging in that mental world and playing with ideas and uh, getting lost in, in uh, some other world, it, it's, it's, it's helpful, it's meditative. Yeah, and I do think it goes in kind of spurts, and it does for me as well. I mean, there are some times where I'm reading almost nonstop, and then other times when I'm not reading as much. And I do think knowledge and information is power, but at some point, and you've done a tremendous job of this, you've also taken that information, that wisdom, and you've translated it into massive action as well, um, yes. because that's what matters. Right. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a Benjamin Franklin quote. It's one of my favorites. Something to the effect of um, all mankind can be divided into three classes. Those that are immovable, those that are movable, and those that move. And if you want to get anywhere, you really do have to be in that latter category. Um, if you're just movable, it's not good enough. You have to act. So yeah, you're absolutely right. That is a critical component. I think that is a fantastic capper on this and a good way to end this episode. And I will also say this, we, we talked about this offline. I do hope that you start podcasting and you mentioned it during the course of, of this interview as well. Write that book. You might make a million off it. You might, you might not, but you've got a tremendous story. And just like what you've done with Renegade, I think if you're able to get what you've learned out there, into into the hearts and minds and hands of of other people that could use it in so many different ways uh, i think it could be tremendously impactful so uh, from one author to hopefully an aspiring author down the road um, i'm hoping that you do that i appreciate that scott thank you very much all right daniel uh thanks again for being on the podcast and uh to all of you out there listening and watching i'm wishing you the best of health happiness high performance keep outperforming. performing